just before we begin. I have to say, isn't that a great hymn for those of you who are in the adult Bible class? It's exactly what we were talking about, exactly. So, and for those of you who don't come to Bible class, maybe you should. All right. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Someone has said that 90% of the things that we worry about never even come to pass. Meaning that what we worry about has only a 10% chance of happening. The problem, beloved, regarding worry is not a material one. It is a spiritual one. And Jesus identifies the problem in our gospel reading today as that of us being of little faith. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, you have promised that your holy word, which goes forth from your mouth, will not return to you empty, but it will accomplish what you desire, and it will succeed in the matter for which you sent it. May your word have its way in every heart, we pray this day, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, let me begin by saying the normal rub, as it were, between, say, evangelicals and Lutherans on the issue of baptism is whether or not God does the baptizing, where he does the work, or whether God does nothing, leaving you to do the work. Now that right there is the big divide on the subject of baptism. Whether God does it for you, or you do it for God. Lutherans simply believe what the scripture says, that when the word, that being God's name, is added to the water, that water is then splashed on the infant or the adult. And when it is, everything is washed away because there, Jesus touches them. And touched by Jesus, one receives the forgiveness of all of their sins, is rescued from death and the devil, given the Holy Spirit, given eternal life, given salvation. What we like to do is ask questions about the one being baptized. Say an infant, for example, and I know probably some of you have heard things like this. Questions like, did the baby deserve it? Did the baby earn it? Did the baby choose it? Did the baby recognize it? Did the baby understand it? Gang, if the questions are all asked about the baby, you always come to bad answers, bad conclusions. But if you ask questions about what Jesus did to the baby and provided for the baby and gave the baby, you get really good answers. Questions like, does Jesus love the baby? Yes. Did Jesus baptize the baby? Yes. Was the triune name of God put on the baby, their forehead on their heart? Yeah. Was the baby given the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Did God forgive the baby? Yeah. Does God save the baby? Yeah. Yeah, he did. And through his work in baptism, God brings forth faith in the heart. It was something that once was not there, just like creation itself. Let there be light. What was there at creation? God's Word, God's Spirit, and water. Creation is a picture of baptism. And what comes forth when you have that combination together? New life. That's exactly what we see in baptism. God brings faith into the heart. His promises call forth faith. Isn't it good to know that faith is not a test that you need to score like a 95 or above to get past the pearly gates? The gospel is Jesus touching you, making promises, giving gifts. Faith is simply the open hand saying, Amen, thank you very much, I'd like some more please. So we have been given faith. 
But so many times, our faith is a little faith. It's a weak faith where we are more like the bruised reeds or the smoldering wicks that you hear about, made this way at times by the fears that we imagine or the worries that we conjure up or manufacture. And this is why it is necessary for Christ Himself to speak to us in a way that undermines those fears and that grows our faith in relation to our worries and our anxieties. Now just imagine Jesus' original audience, rather. Life was very hard for them. Their worries might have included, would the dry, dusty ground produce enough grain for bread? What about the olive oil and the vineyards would they provide this year? Would there be enough fish caught in the Sea of Galilee? Would the sheep produce enough wool to clothe the family? Is there enough money to pay the Roman taxes? And I'm sure the, the list could go on and on. And in our age of advanced technology and better dental hygiene, do Jesus' words no longer apply to us? Absolutely not. There's a whole host of things to worry about. Things like, is this winter going to be harsher than in years past? Or what's going on in the political sphere that's bearing down on our country right now? What about the economy? The retirement funds, or, or really what's left of them? The bills that pile up each month? Health care, my goodness, lots to worry about there. Death and the grave all bearing down on us all. Don't worry. Jesus, you've got to be kidding. There's so much to worry about, and we do. Worry is a cancer of the soul, consuming us from the inside, and it leaves us with sleepless nights and churning stomachs and headaches from time to time, heart palpitations, and loads of stress. Yet Jesus uses a series of gentle rhetorical questions. He invites his disciples to remember that they are living under the Father's daily care. In verse 24, you heard it, Jesus says no one can serve two masters. Jesus doesn't say don't serve two masters. He says no one can do it. This, of course, was common knowledge. It would be impossible, say, to have a slave to split his loyalty between two masters. But then Jesus identifies those two masters by saying no one can serve God and money. Though our sin is, is that we repeatedly try to do so. You know, we tend to think the solution to our worry about money is just to do what? Get more money. I have more money, I wouldn't have to worry about the lack of money I have now. But get this, if you get more money, guess what your new worries become? How do I keep it? How do I keep my brother-in-law from finding out about it? It's terrible. We just trade one worry for another. That's how it is when money becomes an idol. Fearing and loving and trusting in money above all things. Again, the solution to worry is not the physical, it is the spiritual. It is a matter of little faith. And so the solution that Jesus gives is to recover, or rediscover, I should say, rediscover our Father in Heaven. To consider His generous nature, His giving spirit. To, remind it, to be reminded that all things are given unconditionally to unworthy people like all of us and to know that the one who pays such attention to the details will not overlook the big picture, which is you. This is all a refresher course on the nature and the character of God. The church I used to serve at in, um, in uh, where was that? Topeka, Kansas. There was a triptych uh, over the Raridos. It was a triptych, a different stained glass, three different panels, one in the center, and it represented some, it characterized some things about God. And one of the ones that always stuck out to me was this open hand. It's just a, just a stained glass of an open hand. 
the gener- just reminding us all of the generous nature of God. You see, because the question is, what is your Father in heaven like? And here it is. It's all given. Moreover, if He's taken care of the big things, that being the important things, and that He's given you life, the forgiveness of sins, He's rescued you from the devil, taken care of all of those major, eternal things, then He's not going to forget the minor things. It is a common way that Jesus argues from the lesser to the greater. Jesus says in verse 26, Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. The birds are the lesser. Did God become a bird to save them? No. Birds are there for you. And since the hidden hand of God takes care of them, that being the lesser, He's not going to forget about you, that being the greater. Even says, are you much more valuable? Are you much more valuable than they? The question answers itself. Of course you are. Verse 27. Can any one of you add a single hour to your life? Older translations say a cubit. And this was the measure, measurement of a king from his elbow to the tip of his finger. God numbers our days. And all of our worry, all of our fret, cannot add one more cubit of length of all of our days. Your life is in God's hands. It's not yours. And that's how secure that it is. Verse 28, Jesus asks, Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They neither labor nor spin. Flowers don't even go shopping. They don't have to. God takes care of them. Clothing them better than Solomon in all of his royalty and all of his glory. Birds and wildflowers, they are our object lessons. So go out this morning and look up at the birds, beloved. Look down at the flowers. Understanding that if God pays such attention to these minute details, like their food and how they're adorned, then He's not going to forget the big picture, namely. I know it's common sense, but does anxiety put daily bread on the table? Not a crumb. Does anxiety put clothes on your children? Not a stitch. Does anxiety pay the mortgage or the rent? Not a dime. Does anxiety add a single hour to your life? Not a minute. None of that common sense stops us from worrying. So, why do you worry? You worry because you don't believe in Jesus, that's why. You tend to think God needs your help. That He's a little weak, a little slow in his old age. He's got, a little, he's got bigger problems to take care of. And so you and all of your infinite wisdom have to take over where he falls short. None of that is true. For just as God took perfect care of his people in the former times, he continues to take, care, to take perfect care of his people in these gray and latter days. Your Bible says that he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He does not change. Now, Jesus knows the human condition quite well. Not only was he a man, but he created us male and female alike. And Jesus knows that in the fallen condition of our sin-soaked lives, we tend to focus on who God is and on what He's done. So, your worry, it must be rebuked. It must be confessed as the sin that it is. The sinner, sinner then turns from his or her worry, confesses it, and receives 
God's forgiveness and strength to begin anew, to start over. Sure, there may be times when there isn't enough at the end of the month to cover all the bills. Sure. Yes, decisions will have to be made whether something we want is something we really need, but look at the birds of the air. Know that your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? You are. For you have the true God, a loving heavenly Father who loves and cares for you, even sending his only son to die on the brutality of the cross for you, purchasing your redemption so that there is nothing left for you to do but believe. Amen. Thank you very much. May I have some more, please? This is that note that was left in Luther's jacket pocket when he died. It's much longer. We only just summarize it, but it says, we are all beggars. Yes, we are. I wrote down a little bit more than that, but that's the one that you hear the most often. We are beggars. And God is a generous giver. Well, let me just say that verse 33 is the punchline. He says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you as well. You know, if Jesus doesn't tell us to do this, we will forget. Our sin is to get so myopic, so focused on the material, so concerned by what's really right in front of us that we forget altogether about Christ and his gifts. What is his kingdom? His kingdom is his reign. It's the rule, his rule rather, in the hearts of men. It is the Lord's active work among us today. And how does he reign? How does he rule? It's through the forgiveness of sins and by his word. Along with that, seek his righteousness. Notice that's not your righteousness. That is the righteousness that Jesus earned through his perfect life, his perfect obedience to the Father, and through his innocent suffering and death on your behalf. He dies in our place for all of our sins. And this great exchange, again, as Luther called it, our sinfulness is laid upon him, and his righteousness is credited to you. That's his kingdom, that's his righteousness. Jesus says, do not forget these things. So keep on seeking his righteousness by hearing his word, by being absolved of all of your sins, and by partaking in the divine food, the divine supper of his holy body and blood. Well, folks, this is how weak faith is made strong. So when the faith becomes weak, what do you need? Word and sacrament. Word and sacrament. Again, everything is given. God continues to give his life to you with grace so overflowing that your cup will never be empty, but will always run over. You see, because through Christ, our good shepherd, surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise for prayer.